Okay, greetings, brethren. Welcome to another edition of Shepherd's Voice magazine on YouTube. Open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 8. Uh, we're going to read verses 5 to 12. So let's just jump right into it. And of course, I'm convenient, conveniently there already, so I just want to keep the flow going. So chapter Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 12, and this is the centurion who wanted his servant healed by Jesus Christ. So familiar story, but we're going to be looking at this in a couple other areas and, and bringing some understanding together here. It's Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, My Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under, under me. And I say to this one, go, and he, he goes, and to another, come. And he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. So this Roman centurion, he was a some he was a Gentile. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't a, uh, a Jew. And so he's making such a comparison here when he says, "I haven't found it, not even in Israel, such great faith." And I do like this story for other reasons, in the sense that I recognize that if God says something, God wills it. There is there is no. Uh, bureaucracy involved in order we're so used to bureaucracy <laughs> nowadays if something's ever going to get done but when God says he wants it done it'll get done <laughs> there's just no debate about it and I think we should take take that into account in our requests and appeals supplications to God all right continue on but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and Jesus said to the centurion, "Go your way, as, as you have, as you have believed. So let it be done to you." And the servant was healed that same day. So in verse eleven, and many will come from east and west and sit down at Abraham with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. This is this is actually an allusion. We'll go back there. We'll go back to Isaiah in just a moment. But if east and west and, and north and south, <clears throat> or come from the east and west, as it says here, this is those who are afar off. Because here is this is Gentile who believed. And those who are afar off, as Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, who the healing of the Gentiles who were afar off. That's, that's how Paul puts them. So we have this great faith of a centurion, this Gentile. He had about 100 men under him, I think, for a centurion, yet he was concerned about a lowly servant. Let's go to another incident here in Luke chapter 13 and verse 22. Luke 13 and 22. Oops, wrong way. Chapter 13, and we'll pick it up here in verse 22. And he went through the cities and villages teaching, journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, let's go here, strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and not be able. But once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he will answer and say to you, I do not know you, where are you from? And I think the marginal notes on this is, I did not get to know you, where are you from? Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you and yourselves 
thrust out. They'll come from the east and the west, and from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God from afar off. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. So, few who find it. Will there be just few? So the question is put to Jesus Christ. You could almost say, oh Lord, how many do you think are going to be saved, roughly? You know, get a rough number, 10, 20% of the total population that has ever lived. You think 10, 20? What do you think? Just, uh, just rough numbers. Will look. <laughs> It'll be fine, just to, just to give us all here an idea. You know, Jesus Christ isn't, didn't answer it that way, did he? He answered it in a different way. And there's often messages, there's, there's many messages out, I'm sure, you know, we've put some out here too, uh, in writings, et cetera, like it, on questions on theological matters, like how many people will be saved? What about predestination? What about this? What about this part of Israel? All these things. Uh, but here, and I think sometimes the best answer for these very difficult questions is really the same way Jesus Christ answers this difficult question. This is a rather difficult one. He answered it instead of, with the sense of the responsibility on the questioner's part. Whoever it was who questioned it, he or she, we don't know. But he puts, the resp puts responsibility on the one who asked the question, because that's the answer and the best one for the, a, lot of, a, lot of these, a lot of times. So sometimes it's getting these conversations, well, into these deep, theological and, and doubtful things maybe about prophecy and all this is, is really maybe the answer in the discussion shift the discussion over and I've done it a few times I can do a better job of this all across the board <laughs> you know well how, how is your prayer of life how how is that going do you need prayer yourself do, do we want to pray together these kinds of things or in conversations well have you reached out to so-and-so have you reached out to such and such a brethren lately. How are they doing? I haven't heard anything lately. What's going on? Have you been in touch? Have you offered to meet up with them, with your brethren? Have you called them or Skyped them or Zoomed them these, as it is these days? Have you shared the gospel with anyone lately? The good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God. So I try to do that as well, and I know I perhaps can do a much better job of it. But really the question then, instead of uh, these questions that come up like this, answer it in terms of the, the responsibility of the questioner. <laughs> and that's what Jesus done, uh, does over and over again. And that's a lesson to us. So he's being you know, poked about, well, is there few going to be saved, trying to get into these matters. Instead, he's pointing it to their responsibility in the whole question. <laughs> It's your responsibility in the question is your answer. So it's, the question is not who will be saved or the statistical data, etc. Who will be in the first resurrection? Who will be in the second? That's a lot. Of, that's a big question. Has always been thrown around too in some circles. He, but he says it says it here to strive to enter the narrow gate. And the word strived here, as I've talked about, many have talked about it before, is is a Greek word where we get our term agonize. So it takes a, a, a significant amount of effort and getting through difficulty to enter in through the narrow gate. For many will seek, which is a different word, seek to enter, which is really not nowhere near as putting as much effort into it. So when you say seek, well, what, well how, does that, how does that transpire? How do we describe someone who seeks and not strives? I mean, come up with our own ideas. But I think in, in the sense of who he was talking about here, you'll seek, you will see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you will be thrust out. So this is the many, the many, with this false sense of security, something about nationhood, perhaps, because the nation of Israel had many privileges, and they felt that that was something of value to and for them to enter in the kingdom so by some heritage that they will be able to simply not have to agonize about it too much or some reverence for tradition it's not going to do it either and he and he says here you know we you say well you ate and drank in your 
We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. Isn't that good enough? So friendship and familiarity with Jesus will not avail either. So this light-hearted conversion or light-hearted listening or, you know, that's a good sermon the other day or a good sermon, Lord, uh, that you gave us on the streets. Um, when are you coming around again? Kind of thing. Or, or rev more too much reverence for anything else here on earth. Is perhaps another way of seeking it, and we'll kind of elaborate that on a little bit too. But I think one of the main reasons here is later on, verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. You, you were just not willing or just not listening. And that's one of the main reasons, I think, for those who will not enter the kingdom of God. All right. Well, I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm still on this page right here. <clears throat> so the faithful servant, <clears throat> this is the point here. So this goes back to the questioner. He's talking about his involvement, his responsibilities. So the faithful servant in doing his or her part, contributes to the work and increases the harvest so that more will be saved. So you see the, the, the important point here is instead of just asking about statistics, now don't worry about the statistics. Think about where your part is, strive to enter, in your, in, to enter into the narrow gate, and in doing so, you'll be thinking about what your part is for yourself, but what your part is in helping others to strive and enter their narrow gates so that the harvest will be plentiful. Because the workers are few, their laborers are few, right? So it puts the responsibility on us. So if we start thinking about these kinds of questions, or, di or difficult ones, well, where's my responsibility in doing the work in the will of God? In the question itself. Something for us to, to think about more, so that more will be saved and God will be glorified doing his will, entering, entering the works of the harvest. So it's not so much what the outcome ultimately is, but what your personal contribution is to the harvest. That is what's in your purview. So I think there's a number of things outside of our purview in this whole process, in this whole process towards the kingdom of God. It just is. I can't imagine we should know everything because some things are in only in the, the purview of Jesus Christ and God the Father. And the last time I spoke is, 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 is talking about God's judgment, his sovereign judgment, where we misrepresent or misunderstand his sovereign judgment. And if we place ourselves in that position and start saying, this is how he will judge, then that's a problem. So sometimes we need to understand and recognize what our limitations are. And some have gone ahead and, and, and said what sparked some of that message last, or two, two weeks ago, I think it was, where those were saying, and there's no second resurrection to life. This is the only time salvation. And everyone has an opportunity, and that's it. And, and the whole argument that comes from this group is that, no, there is no excuse. Or not if you haven't heard it it's still no excuse <laughs> and they use various arguments through in the scriptures so I, I just don't want to go there but I took a slide from it the other day because there's those on the other end of the spectrum in this that think yeah it's only going to be few so they want to argue to explain yeah it's going to be few only few will be saved so they want to make this argument. But I don't know why anyone want want to, because now it, you, it sort of steps away from the responsibility, I think. And they had a couple of, there was one slide that says, well, we do well to remember, only eight were saved during the flood, right? Or only three escaped the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Only two men out of 600, some odd thousand, over the age of 20, were permitted to enter the land of Canaan. 
you know, this is like looking at statistics and numbers in order to make argument, argue a case. And, and we need to avoid that kind of thing to try to say this is how God judges in the end. <laughs> so we need to, you know, some things are just not in our peer view. We should instead focus on ourselves and focus on what God has asked us to do faith, faithfully for him. So I just want to make that point. It's not really central to what I'm talking about. All right. Let's make sure I got myself in order here. No, we'll stick. We'll stay here. So we have this contrast. We have this contrast between the righteous and the workers of iniquity. Those who come from far, afar, and sit down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there will be those who are he, he describes as workers of iniquity. There's this contrast that we want to kind of flush out just a little bit further. I think as a whole, I think as a whole, the difference or the difference between the two can, is really differentiated by their hearts, being about the success of God, which I may have discussed in some other point in time, the success of God. We embrace his passion, we come, become passionate for his truth, and we become passionate about sharing it with others. That's our objective. And that passion comes from within. It's something that we embrace. You know, faith is a gift from God, but as we develop and grow in grace and knowledge, we, we can start to embrace and get to know God because the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. That's God's very person is revealed, and we also want to, we also adopt into his own faithfulness to us. We want to be part of the program, be faithful workers in the field. So we adopt that passion. It becomes a part of us as well, because that passion comes some, somewhere deep inside him, and we want to share in the same. So those, when we try to differentiate, differentiate here, I think that's one major element. The righteous will sit down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. Those who are been passionate about his will and always will be and passionate for his glory. The workers of iniquity are privileged in that they knew things they knew things. They belong to this and they belong to this or that. And I'm thinking they had reverence for their beliefs, but did not develop a relationship of mutual trust with God. I didn't know you. I never got to know you. And we don't want that to happen to us. We don't want, we want to say to those things that get in our way or might cause us to stumble, get away from me. Get away from these kinds of things. And it takes an effort to do that. That's striving. That's part of the striving. I detect, I detect this kind of stuff when there's too much reverence for some belief system or some doctrine, okay, or some heritage, or some other way of feeling that they'll be inducted into the Kingdom of God Hall of Fame. When I sense these, these few things I want to talk about, I, but I detect when the pride of things enters the conversation, when the pride does. Too much language about their own success or successes. Too much language about the success of their doctrine or their group. And, and this one's actually very common now is the success of their own nation that they live in. They feel that they're first in their own eyes with this, but they are in fact last in God's eyes. As he says here, and indeed there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. And that's what I think Jesus Christ is expressing there. Those who are in cults, Christian cults, or some exclusive Christian sectarian systems, these sects uh, are of this nature. That's what I detect. 
we are doing the work. This is where it's happening. And I'll have a short little discussion on that in just a minute. That, to me, is a red flag when I see that being a Christian conversation. And this is something we speak out against here on this channel quite regularly. There's also something here what I call domesticated Christianity, where they have adapted their needs to the needs of the nation. And this ta is taking decades and decades and decades to, for this kind of things to happen. It goes back to the Roman Empire, for crying out loud. They basically have adapted their beliefs to the needs of the nation and got too involved into the politics of the nation and the nation's needs. All right. And there's an example of this. It's in John chapter 11 and verse 47 and 48. This is just a clear example in the Bible that just popped, and popped into my head. In verse 47, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked, here is this man performing many signs. It says here, if we let him go like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. All right. So the Jewish rebellion, what they're worried about is a Jewish rebellion that Jesus Christ might cause. And the Romans have already had a history of just squashing any rebellions because they had the power. And so a Jewish rebellion would be devastating to the people and, would be, and it would be squashed by the Roman powers. And this is what they recognized. But Jesus Christ elsewhere said, my kingdom is not of this world. Maybe they weren't listening. I don't know. But at the same time, these men will push the idea of Jesus Christ being a political rebel. This is what they wanted to do. Push him to be, as a political rebel for their own ends. They are just as concerned about the loss of their place, right, in the power structure at, that they're in, as they were about the annihilation of their people. So annihilation of their people, they would lose their status and their place. We take away both our temple and our nation. So they are worried about that. To me, that's kind of like a domesticated religion already. All right, so it was about national and positional preservation, more about being passionate for God's will. And that was the issue. Though they still believed, you know, they still believed their beliefs were for the pres preservation of God's will. They thought they were doing God's will. And that made a, they made a big mistake, mistake this way. It's just the same thing today. And we need to be careful of that when we're hearing messages that would teach us this kind of thing about preservation. Preservation of the systems of Wren so that we have our place and our nation. That's a problem. Do not conflate the success and preservation of a nation with the success of God either. That's a mistake we see often or the success of God in the gospel. Believing America and the free world stand need to, world need to stand and, and also need to get back to God. Those kinds of messages, that's putting two things together that we, we shouldn't be. It's not part of the gospel message. We don't want to get down that, go down that direction. So all to me, all this is the workers of iniquity. As Jesus Christ would describe what I just, just talked to here about workers of iniquity. They didn't have a passion for God's will. They had a passion for their own. They had a passion for their nation, but it was preservation of, of their nation. Not for God's sake, but for their own sake. That was the concern. So to me, that's workers of iniquity. Never, God doesn't get to know anybody who wants to pursue that. At least I don't think so. So that's why we bring this up often. It's not, we want to put our hearts, success, our hearts towards and align with God's success. The success of the world 
and the success of God are mutually exclusive. I don't see the common overlap. God uses the systems that are in place now for his purpose, but that's his call. So we don't want to make that, we don't want to conflate these issues. They're just mutually exclusive. In fact, the success of God will be in the decline of a power, powerful nation in reality. It happens that way with Israel, as a matter of fact. So this is very real that we need to watch out for. We're going to continue to strive to enter through the narrow gate so that we don't get sidetracked and go down the easy path and just seek to enter based on other principles, principles that we've been told maybe are true, but they're really not. They're just not. They're actually, it's actually a falsehood. You know, this is a kind of an example, as I have heard, his examples are, are good. So there's another recent message, you know, in my Facebook feed posted by a friend on Facebook, um, somebody I've never met, but he was a one time on our DVD program anyway. I've corresponded with him a couple of times on Messenger, and we can just have short discussions. But he posted a sermon on there, and it was really short. It was actually a, not even, it was kind of like a, like a sermonette kind of thing, 15 minutes or so long. So I gave it a little listen to, and nothing better to do. Sometimes when you're working all day, you just want to just watch something. You just want to watch something and see, just to take it easy for a bit. Well, there was a number of things in that short message. I almost took exception to 80 or 90 percent of it. And I was like, well, what, what is all this? This is packed into this one thing, and I took so much exception to it. But the other one, the fellow felt it was important enough to post, so I, what I did is I put together two pages of notes real quick, typed them up, and sent it to him. Anyway, uh, there's a couple of things that was said here, and I said, I want to this is why I want to express the importance of this. And this is what he was saying on a couple areas. There was a whole bunch of different topics. A lot of it had to do with fear, putting fear. And there was youth in that, in that, uh, in that group based on what he was saying, but and putting fear and all these kinds of things in there. And like, you know, that's not what we should be preaching, preaching fear. But he says here, we're, he's talking about the southern border. He says, being invaded by foreigners. Foreigners with COVID-19 variants. These people bring in variants and infect our kids in school. That's what he said. We're being invaded by foreigners. You know, these people. Now, I think if you've been watching this program often enough, I think you know where the exception is. So in my notes to this fellow, I said, look, a nation has a right to manage its own borders. That's, a, that's perfectly fine by me. But as Christians, especially from the pulpit, our conversation must know no borders. The gospel, it goes out to everyone. The commission was go out to every nation, tribe, and tongue and tell and preach the gospel. It knows no borders. The gospel has no borders. Yet, in these messages here, the gospel is coming out as though it has borders. And those people... I said, the gospel does not distinguish by race either, I said to him. To vilify far less privileged people than himself, a privilege only by the chance of birth, an unearned privilege, is very wrong. And the word of God speaks against it. And I said here, what we see here is a product of nationalism. This is about self-preservation, preserving the nation for selfish reasons. Excuse me. And that's one big example of it. Another one is here is, uh, and what about Afghanistan, he says. He mentions it's humiliating to the US. He says, we, a superpower, and then please don't burn down our embassy. So he thinks it's humiliating what's happened in Afghanistan. So we, a superpower. So what I wrote him, I said, we need to understand that Jesus Christ rejects worldly power and the glory of the nations. He rejected it. He was offered the nations by Satan, but he rejected it. And at any time of, of America's existence, if, if Satan offered Jesus Christ America, he'd say no. They're not gonna broker a deal. Well, what, well, 
I won't bow down and worship you. Well, can we do something in between? Give me America. And I'll give you some some uh, some some uh, points uh, or some other credit somewhere else. You know, it's just it's just ridiculous. He outrightly rejects it. So why are we hearing it in churches? This is very typical. And Sabbatarian churches of God. So this is where it's a serious thing. So I've written the fellow. I haven't heard back yet. Um, see what he has to say. You know, another question was asked of uh, Jesus that is relevant to this discussion. And it's in Luke 12. I think it's back up a couple of pages. And... There's the whole story here of Luke 12. It comes up to the point. And at some point, Peter asks a question. So what we're going to do here instead, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to go to a whiteboard presentation that was done a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. No, it must be two years now, at least two years, that some of you have seen before. It's a short little presentation. And then I'm going to allow it to speak for itself, and then we'll... Come back here and we'll resume the message. So I'll see you in just a few minutes. Who can be saved? Who is God working with? Where is the true church? Some churches ask these questions of their audience as part of their outreach programs, as they are questions similar to even what the disciples asked of Christ directly. They seem especially appropriate given the doctrinal confusion in the world and the many different denominations. And the simple even yes or no answers to such questions would certainly be much preferred by many. Just give me the answer, and that is all we need, and I'll be good with that. Such is human nature, it seems, and therefore many with great assurance to their viewers offer the answers they are looking for. Christ, however, does not answer us on our own terms, even though our terms often seem fair enough. In reality, these questions and the expected answers are often born out of a skewed and narrow perspective of God and His will. Christ offers us a broader understanding. When we gain broader understanding, answers will start to come into proper perspective, which will give anyone who can accept it, and is willing to work for it, a fuller sense of purpose. Luke, in his Gospel account, records an event worthy of consideration. Chapter 12 begins with a description of the scene. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, Christ then taught his disciples and also the crowd. He began to emphasize a broad spectrum of teaching on hypocrisy, the fear of God, God's care, to be ready, with their heart in the right place, and to be ready on the day of their master's visitation. Then came a question from Peter. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us, or to all people? Peter's question also reflects a narrow view of God's will in the time of his training. Christ's answer was based on accountability, and likened it to the accountability of the servant to his master. Let's look at Christ's answer in a few parts. First, there is the faithful and wise steward who knew his master's will and acted on it. He is graciously rewarded. And there is the steward who knew his master's will and did not make provisions for it, and moreover abused his privilege. That servant will be cast out. And there is the servant who knew his master's will but did not act on it. That servant will be spared but punished with many stripes. Lastly, there is the one who did not know, even the non-servant, and conducted himself falsely in life. This one would be spared, but beaten with a few stripes. Christ gives us a summary of this portion of his answer. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Christ's answer to Peter is in terms of how he judges on behalf of the Father. The answer, therefore, regarding Peter's question would appear to be that Jesus Christ had all in view, but in varying degrees. This means we need to be careful not to put a filter on Christ, because here he also asks us to consider the measure we have of ourselves in the faith, or even how we interpret the faith. 
God does not look upon the signs over the doors of churches when judging individual Christians. However, church leaders who suggest they have a special or exclusive claim on God or to his truth should be considered suspect. A failure to do so can lead to very distorted ideas of God's will and of the self. Therefore, the question is not one of us or them or who he is working with and who he is not or where it is happening or not. Christ is aware that we can limit ourselves in spite of our proclaimed faith. Therefore, as we open our understanding to God's will and passion, questions such as who he is with and who he is not become less relevant. Instead, our attention will be directed to the joy in taking whatever measure of faith and understanding we have been given and begin to use it, move it, and work for more of it as we grow. This is not an us or them or who is or who isn't faith. Rather, it is a judgment on the measure of faith one has, however limited or however great, that looks out for the interests of the great master. You're back. All right. So I hope that was helpful and it probably was familiar to some of you who have seen it already before. But in verse 45, I want to look at a, look at a couple of places here in verse 45. It says of uh, Luke chapter 12, <clears throat> But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, that master of the servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him into point him, in, cut him in two, and appoint him with his portion with the unbelievers. Well, that's very strong language. So the irresponsibility of this servant is related to he's not interested in God's success. He was only interested in his short-term personal success of some kind. This is not how it works. To me, this is kind of the workers of iniquity that we need to be careful of. We need to stick to the apostolic teachings of Jesus Christ. Don't allow other loyalties to enter into the message. We can't allow ourselves, our message to be domesticated. We can't be so worried about the success of the nation and stop thinking that the success of the church is tied to a success of a nation or its worldly power or its economic power. We cannot do that. We cannot do these kinds of things and teach it to other people, especially young people. So I want to go back to Luke chapter 13, verse 29, and Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11. But I'll read the, it's basically saying the same thing here in Luke 13, 29. They will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. Christ is alluding to something back here in Isaiah chapter 49. So let's just spend a little time here today, maybe get a little understanding here of what Jesus Christ intended to do. So, Isaiah, in chapter 49, we're almost there. Here we go. And we'll just read, we'll read maybe, we'll probably read the 12 verses here, just to be the flow for consistency. All right, so Isaiah chapter 49 here. And let's pick it up here in verse 1. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother, and he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he has hidden me. So his mouth having a sharp sword. He's both a servant and a warrior. And we are to be in his likeness. We are to be a servant, but also be like warriors too. There's an element of our walk and our faith to be like warriors, using the Word of God in the way that is as powerful and penetrating. That's part also part of the walk. All right. And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So that sometimes 
that could be a little confusing in the language. But when he says here, and he said to me, Oh, you, you my servant, O Israel, in whom I am glorified. Now Israel was called to glorify God and be a light to the Gentiles, as it's talking about here. A light in the darkness. But Israel failed. Now the Messiah here is being called Israel. He has taken that place. So I hope that kind of helps this in, in whom I will be glorified. And then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vain. Yet surely my just reward is my, 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 my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now he says to me who formed me from the womb to the servant to bring back Jacob back to him so that Israel is glory gathered in him. For I shall glor be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. All right, so here again, I mean, we're to continue in this as well. He says, you know, it sounds in here, you know, um, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vain. You know, we're to continue in this thing as well, even though Christ appeared to have failed, right? And that sometimes we too appear to be failing. But again, we're not to go about continually evaluating it evaluating our progress of spreading the gospel. That's not what we're, that's a distraction, I think. Because he says here, I've spent my strength in vain, yet surely my just reward is with the Lord. It's God will sort this out and my work with God. So it all seemed very vain, like it wasn't going to work, or that Christ was failing. But he is succeeding, and we will succeed too with him. But it's, it's his judgment in the end for all this. If we continue to evaluate the church's performance, then I think we're gonna, it's gonna be, it might get rather depressing. Because we are to labor by faith. And by faith, that is that leads to the success of God. We are called not to be successful, but to call to be, have a life of faith. All right? Let's continue reading over here. Let's pick it up here. In, I think, verse 8. Well, let's just actually read verse 6. And he says, It's too small a thing for you should be that you should be my servant to raise up tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, and you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. All right. Let's continue reading here from verse 8. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may go, that you may, that you may say to the prisoners, Go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourself. They shall, be feed, they shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all the desolate heights. All right, so Christ here, in a sense, he's brought liberty to the people. He's, he's like the new Moses as well. And so it kind of relates to the Gentiles too, as it goes far and wide. They, that temple needed to be restored. That temple and the people there in Jerusalem after the captivity in Babylon the temple and the people and the city had to be restored. Because if it wasn't restored, then the promises of the Messiah could not have happened. If there's no temple, no Jerusalem, nor would he, nor would he taught, nor would he, he suffered and died. So it needed to be restored. So that's one of the background reasons this happened. And he did this for the Jews and the Gentiles. And verse 10 and 12, they look beyond the deliverance from Babylon to a future kingdom. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. All right. He will bring the Jewish and Gentiles from the ends of the earth. I will make each my, each my mountains a road, and my highway shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and from those from the land, of Sinim. 
So that's what Price back here, I think, was alluding to, and others think so as well. He will bring the Jews, Jewish people, and Gentiles from the ends of the earth. This is what he tends to do. So it sounds like more of a many to me. Regardless. But who will not be in this collection of people? Who will not be in this? Well, Jesus Christ says, the sons of the kingdom, those who practice iniquity. Those who have put an institution or nation ahead of his will, ahead of his will, and his will is to gather all things in Christ. Putting other things ahead as a priority, not being passionate about God's will. And that's the point. He even says in the book of Revelation, eventually come out of her, my people. Must you share in the plagues? So this is a very serious matter. We want to be aligned to his passions. And this is something we need to pray about. When you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's aligning your whole thinking and thoughts. And you say it the way you need to say it. And you, pr you put this in the forefront of your mind and of your heart. And it'll protect you from all this other extraneous stuff that does you harm and no good. And we don't want to participate in that harm and no good. We want God to know who we are. He, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, and went to the kingdom of heaven, but those who do, does my Father's will, will enter or will be saved. You know, the world is full of people who want to serve in an advisory capacity. There's actually a, a plaque on a wall or on any, any given office. The world is full of people who want to serve in an, an advisory capacity. You know, and it comes out in different ways. It's sort of like it's non-participation, but it's participation in an advisory capacity. You know, the church should do this. You should do this. They should do that. That's not, that's seeking. You know, yeah, you know, I was there. I've, I've been around. No. And there's full people who want to serve as analysts as well. Oh, keep up the good work. Check out your participation level. Go back to some of the things I even suggested. Have you been in contact with your brothers and sisters? Have you arranged to meet? Have you been in contact? Have you been putting the ball forward? Are you thinking about them? That's the idea. That's very much a part of our participation. Are we praying according to God's will? Are we really need to get rid of those other distractions that are, that are out there right now. We are called to a life of faithfulness. God learns who we are, and we learn more about him. Because I know myself, I have come from afar, and so have you. At the time this gospel was preached, we were nothing but dust and water. And I have no heritage to genetic heritage that I can even imagine that goes back to Abraham. I have come from afar. And I want to always appreciate that I've come from afar. So that I can sit down with these, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and be part of the righteous. Because I want to align my hearts and my mind to his will and his passion. And I want you as well to do so. So far more will come from afar still. And that's the title of this message. Far more will come from afar yet still. And that's something we all need to pray about. So God bless all of you. That will take the end of the presentation. I hope this is helpful. As always, email us, send the comments, uh, stay in contact, don't be shy, and let's carry on this journey together towards God's kingdom and seeing God's glory. We'll see you here next time on Shepherd's Voice Magazine YouTube. You take care.